Hi, I'm Michelle Fenton, and welcome to the Happy Texture Podcast. What would it take to develop resilient, sustainable communities? How do we design cities that support our collective happiness? Join me as my guests and I discuss how we can plan, implement, and foster places that allow us to flourish and grow. I'm delighted to chat with my dear friend, mentor, bridge builder, and change maker, Emil Reddy. Hope you enjoy this episode of the Happy Texture Podcast. We're really pleased to have Emil Reddy on the Happy Texture Podcast as part of the Happy Texture family today. And Emil is a very dear friend of mine and one of my coaches, or some, hopefully soon to be coach, soon, yeah. uh, on uh, Jedi issues, justice equity, diversity, and inclusivity. So I thought it was would be great to have you here to talk about these issues and not just talk about them as problems, but look towards solutions that we can have as a, as a collective. Mm-hmm. When we talk about, I mean, it is a Happy Texture podcast and we focus on space, but certainly space comes from an idea, from a set of perspectives. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I think it's really important to take a step back and understand what are those ideas and thoughts and perspectives that go into how we design space and how we think about the spaces we use. And so Emil Reddy, thank you and welcome to the Happy Texture Podcast. Thank you. I love that you brought up perspectives because I think whenever folks ask me to, for example, to introduce myself and I think about even just how we get into introductions Often people start with a very specific perspective, which is a perspective of focus on academia. So where I went to school, Mm -hmm. uh, work experience, any uh, big brands that I've worked with, the duration of my experience. And as a diversity, equity and inclusion expert and uh, consultant, that's usually what people want to know right away. Mm -hmm. And what I've done is I've disrupted the idea of a biography. I love that. And uh, and I will like talk about it from the perspective a little bit of uh, activist language here, where I'm trying to get away from the Western colonial context of a bio- biography, which is what I just started with: education, work mm-hmm. experience, any like large organizations I'm partnering with, um, and really center diversity of perspective. And what that is 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 focusing on my personal lens. So if you were to ask me to introduce myself, um, which I will do for the sake of this podcast, I would say my name is Emil Reddy, my pronouns are they, them, and I am a um, non-binary, trans, Asian, Pacific Islander, and that's a mouthful. Sometimes I feel like I sound like an airline when I say that, <laughs> um, but that's important that, that is, that's really what I love to start with, is to start with my identity and to start with my name, my pronouns. Uh, and also the fact that I'm a child of immigrants mm-hmm. and I'm a grandchild of indentured laborers, which is also really important for me to name. Yes. Uh, the fact that I am one of the epitomes of the Indian diaspora, uh, having lineage to Nepal, Rajasthan, and a very small island in the South Pacific, which is Fiji. And if not for colonization, my... Um, Grand, great grandparents, grandparents, and parents would never have met. Uh, so I'm a product of that. But my joke around it is that my great grand- grandfather would never have crossed the Himalayas for a Tinder date. So <laughs> I guess that's one way to yeah. also look at it. And that's the other thing: having having humor in this is important because yeah. even just saying those words of indentured la- laborers is really a nicer term for slavery. Yes. Well, it is. You know. A, a form of slavery. Absolutely. Just be really clear. Yeah. You know, Indians were were one of the favorites of, of the colony to, or the British colony to take all over the world. Mm-hmm. And that's why so many of us are everywhere. And with that in mind, I'm also a parent uh, to both fur and human babies, which is has really defined who I am, I would say, in my uh, late 30s, early 40s has definitely defined me. 
and I'm a partner to someone who challenges me, I definitely could have gone the easier route there, but I didn't. Yeah. And, um, and then I always end with like where, how I work. And I know that that's what's really important to people. And I start with my relationships and my identity because that's really, it's really important to me. Mm-hmm. But how I work is I am a friend and a bridge builder and a lifelong student of Jedi, of justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. And the three, those three things that I bring up are purposeful because in this work, I hope that I'm a friend rather than an expert or a leader because a friend is someone that you're happy to walk alongside with yes. and to learn from. That's a beautiful distinction. Yeah. yeah. And also, you know, that you will also teach your friend, you know, yes. it's a reciprocal relationship and reciprocity is so important in this work. And building a bridge means that I get to build the bridge like a true community developer does, which is how I identify and not walk over it for Mm -hmm. my clients, for my friends, for the organizations and people I support. I witness their journey, but I will never take it for them. Right. And being a student, I think, is so important. I do think that comes from my um, Indian and Buddhist uh, background, where I know that I am a student of the world. Yes. Um, And then I do like to end with some levity, which is that I'll always choose coffee over tea, except my mom's chai, (laughs) because you can't mess with an Indian mother. Nope. Or any mother. Or or good chai. (laughs) Or good chai, yeah. Um, And bread making over bread winning, because I do love making things with my hands, and trails over streets. Wow. Yes. And that is my lens. Yeah. That's how I introduce myself. Well, I find, I, I, I love the idea of identity and the, and your story about your personal lens and your identity is not fixed. It's got so many layers. It's so nuanced. It's so rich and so inclusive in, in a way. And I think when we talk about identity, I think one of the things that we need to appreciate is that a person is coming or you're seeing or, or witnessing that person who's a whole human mm. with so many things that they bring to the table. And so to identify someone just based on one thing, you're missing 90% or 95% of everything else that they are. Absolutely. And you've essentially uh, defined in such a like accessible way what intersectionality is, right? Mm we often see someone that is racialized or or queer or trans and we see them as that one thing without realizing that there's so much nuance and there's so much to a person. Mm -hmm. Often I am, I am a parent more than anything else, like uh, dropping my kids off or, or trying to get Eleanor to the potty before she has an accident. Like I use that example often where I'm, you know, out in public and I am trying to get, you know, she gives me like a 30 second warning of like, I got to go. And when you're dealing with a three year old, you just, you got to find a way to let her go. And I have been policed so often with the choice of restroom that I decide to choose. And I know it shouldn't always be about bathrooms, but my goodness, when in that moment, I am not trans. In that moment, I am a parent yes. trying to get my kid to... With a child with a need. With a need. And I'm, a, I'm absolutely a parent. The flag that I am flying is parent. Right. But when I'm being interacted with certain folks, what they're seeing is um, something that's challenging their sense of identity mm-hmm. um, and my gender. Yeah. And it's like, we got to just meet someone where they're at and not necessarily put our own biases onto them or our own feelings and thoughts. Well, I think that, I mean, that really talks to how we identify with each other and the permission to use space, depending on what someone identifies you to be, Mm -hmm. you know? And one of the things that certainly in, when I think about the purpose of happy texture is to try and open up the idea that, or space or architecture or streets or communities can be so much richer and so much more resilient if we start including all aspects of the human Mm -hmm. person. Uh, One of the things that I certainly support, and I know you do this work, so I'd love to get to talk to you more about it, is the idea of bringing all the wisdom to the to the table or the circle mm-hmm. um, and, and allow for change to be part of the dialogue 
and to support people when change becomes something of a resistance. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, even just the example of that person that saw me and was right away wondering what I was doing or where I was going. I always think about when we're trying to create big systemic change that we always need to start with individuals. I follow a pretty simple theory of change in the work that I do when I'm consulting or training or working alongside of people. And that is that if we can support individuals to really confront their own perspective and their own biases, we all have biases, by Mm -hmm. the way, like, you know, if I could just say spoiler alert, like (laughs) we all have them, Yes. whether or not they're, they're conscious, unconscious, whether or not they're explicit or implicit. And, uh, we, we just, one, we all have diversity perspective. We all are diverse in our, our thinking and our being. We all have lived experience that is diverse. Every single one of us, Mm -hmm. we need to really understand who we are as individuals first, before we could start claiming to be champions or allies or, or, you know, abolitionists when it comes to trying to change systems, we need to know who we are as people. Right. And so that's why I always say change starts with an individual to do that work. Not that you can't be doing other things at the same time, but really uncovering, understanding, and then unlearning what it is and relearning what it is that you've learned over the past, you know, your whole life. Mm -hmm. And so much of this is ingrained in us from a very, very young age. When I go to pick up Eleanor from... From school, I hear her yelling, Daddy, as she comes running up to me. And I remind her, we say Appa in our language. And she's just, what she's doing is is modeling and mimicking what's being modeled to her and Mm -hmm. what other kids say. She's three. When people wonder when gender stereotypes and uh, and tropes and those things come up, this child is three. Yes. And already there's a system, a framework in place. Everyone has a mommy and daddy, right? And She's, she's trying to, to be the best kid that she can be, but also to, to feel like she belongs. Yes. And so using the language that she is, is hearing around her. And so as individuals, we need to start unlearning some of that and relearning new ways that are a bit more inclusive and expansive. Only then can we then start tackling what's happening in our own systems uh, around us, which is our own um, family members are part of our system. Mm -hmm. Our own school and educational systems are part of the systems that we as individuals interact with. Our political systems, our healthcare systems, our um, overarching sociocultural context of where we live and which nation we're involved in and the global politics of that, and then what we define as culture. Before we tackle those big systemic changes, we need to realize that we live right smack dab in the middle of all those systems Mm -hmm. and we interact with them consistently and constantly. And probably chances are we're a product of those systems. Definitely. Maybe chances are we don't necessarily see it explicitly. Mm -hmm. Like your kid saying daddy is just, that. that's a really great example of how early this indoctrination is into a system Mm -hmm. that is not wide enough or deep enough to express the total human condition. Absolutely. And when these systems, so there's a really actually great visual for folks if they want to look it up and Broffenbrenner ecological framework is what I would Google here. And Broffenbrenner came up with this system in 1979 where there was a recognition that each individual is surrounded by systems. And so when I talk about systemic oppression or systemic discrimination, I always go to this model because you can see how one individual is interacting with all these systems on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. So in order to really help support individual and collective change, we need to also reimagine systems. Right. And when these systems were created, whether it's educational systems or healthcare or political um, uh, systems, it was often created for, with, and by people with homogenous lived experience. So what I mean by that is there was no malice intent or a malicious intent, but if there was a bunch of white, middle-aged, cisgendered, which means a person who identifies with the sex they're assigned at birth, uh, all in a room, they're going to create a system yes. that makes sense for middle-aged, white, cisgendered yeah. men, yeah. right? So it's not that they were, weren't were thinking about discriminating against people. They were thinking through the, their own lens. 
And that lens was pretty homogenous. Those, when we talk about, we need a seat at the table. Those are the tables that we're talking about where there is a table of people that are recreating systems or, or establishing or implementing systems. We need to have diversity perspective at that table. Yes. I mean, I think, I think that the, the discussion now is starting to show that we really need to start thinking of a different way Yeah, to think about structuring our systems. I mean, we have what we have as a great example of what, you know, the, the structure that we, we were born into produces. Yeah. We can see it all around. I, I don't think everyone is excited about it. Mm-hmm. I don't think most people would say that this is a fantastic model and we should just keep going. I think most people would agree that some change needs to happen. Yeah. Uh, I'm curious when you say the theory of change and not to get too Mm -hmm. um, analytical or academic about it. What are some of the foundations when we talk about theory of change? Yeah. So first of all, like a theory of change in general, before I dive into my own is, is really the theory that I use to really advance um, awareness and competency when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion. So if I want to advance an organization or an individual along their journey, what I call a Jedi journey, then I will use that theory of change where I'll, I will start with them as an individual. Uh, with, and that includes individuals within, you know, a global scale organization where we will literally train and increase awareness and competency in individual members of that team or with a, with a, uh, a coach as a coach with like a CEO that I'm working with. Once that individual is starting to increase their competency and awareness, they can then start having a very critical and analytical lens to the systems that they're involved with and that they touch. So there's awareness of your own position, positionality, and then there is awareness in the positionality of the systems that you... Imagine having, because of the initial individual awareness, you've now been given 3D glasses so that when you then start looking at the systems that you have power and agency of actually changing and shifting because you're the leader of an organization or you're someone who um, is at one of those tables Uh of change, you now can actually see through that 3D glasses of you doing that internal work of where the disparities are and where the potential opportunities also are to expand those systems. And then the hope is moving along that journey that then you can impact the world right. and start creating collective change, not just for your organization, yourself, your family, your individualistic needs, but also what would impact everyone else. And that's why it's individual group or team or system and then world. Mm-hmm. And the reason why I encourage people to do the journey in that, in that particular order is what we saw during what we see every year during pride month. And what we saw last June or two Junes ago was the black square, mm-hmm. right? Or the pride flag really, really well-intentioned people and really well-intentioned companies and organizations uh, rallying, wanting to rally support around a great cause and posting the black, black square or, um, June was, is pride month posting that pride flag. That was very external and very like facing to the world. But the moment that you scratch that surface where, you know, maybe someone on social media asks the question, so what are you actually doing for black folks? Yes. What are you actually doing for queer folks? What are you doing for queer black folks? Yes. And there isn't a response. Mm-hmm. There's well intentions, but no systemic change within that organization. Right. That's why I don't encourage companies to go external facing and world facing first before doing some of right. like show me the receipts, you know, yes. like get <laughs> yes. into your own yeah. kitchen and start start cooking up some some really great things and and changing the way that you work. Yeah. And then the reason why I say individuals before organizations, which is that middle step, is often if you are leading a huge team and you're the CEO and you say, you know, Jedi is extremely important, justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion. We want to focus on uh, increasing support for the black community and the queer community then your staff just feel like you're doing it to them. It's happening at them. Right. They're not, it's not happening with them. Yeah. You're not actually hearing from them what it is that they find important. And Hey, what about the queer and black folks that are on your team? I'm sure they have something to say and something that, that they want to contribute. Uh, And so starting with the team also means that you're listening and using the grassroots perspective of building from the ground up. And so individual 
group world. Yeah. It's pretty simplistic in the way that you can visualize it, but the impact of if you were to follow that theory of change is it's actually it's world changing. Yeah. I mean as from an architect's point of view, we'd call that scale, right? Mm. You've got the in the small scale. Mm. which is which might be your little detail yeah. and then you've got your house and then you've got the urban context within which your house sits uh, which for me is, is pretty straightforward and one of the things I, I see I'm starting to see is a really strong foundation foundational base mm. of learning um, empowering the individual to then represent and or impact Mm -hmm. the world and in an incredibly powerful way. Yeah. You know, and, and I, I love what you said about in the beginning in your introduction that you're also a learner when you think about, uh, or a student, when you think about it from a Buddhist sense, because one of the things I want to maybe let's, let's maybe challenge this thought I have is you have the individual, you've got your community, your team, and you've got the world, but then should we just, should we keep that cycle oh, going back? Yes. Should we just keep, learning the site because what you learn when you go out to have impact work is something you can take back in that and reframe and relearn yourself and so in a way that learning is a continual commitment oh yeah to yourself as a human being and as a leader it's an ongoing journey and we saw that come come to to bear you know when the black lives matter movement came up the world was shouting Mm -hmm. I mean, we've been shouting for a long time. Let's be but, honest, we've been shouting yes, for a very long time. Yes, we've been shouting with zero megaphones, right. you know, and no, to basically a wall mm -hmm. for so many generations. And that was a lot of individuals learning from the world, because the world is going to be a part of, when I say the world, I mean the global cultural context, is going to be part of teaching us as well, mm -hmm. of you know, really shouting uh, what is important and what we really do need to focus on. And those leaders that are listening will absolutely take that back to their individual learning and then take that individual learning and, and ensure that their whole team knows about it and continues to increase their own internal capacity and then together create the next strategy that will be a part of that, yeah. that world uh, trend, as it were. And right now, if I could be a trend forecaster, it would be that anyone's work in the justice, equity, diversity, and inclusion world needs to have the intersection of what social and eco-justice really is, mm -hmm. because that is what the world, I think, really needs right now. Often, we sometimes see these things at odds. We can't have racial justice and eco-justice right. at the same time without recognizing that the folks that are most impacted by climate change are the folks that are at the margins. Yes. And so we do need a rallying cry that has both of those things together. And I do think a lot of activists see that as we see with indigenous mm -hmm. um, sovereignty and the support of indigenous sovereignty within marginalized communities. But I think the world needs to realize that that intersection is extremely important. I think it also goes back to your introduction just struck me as, you know, your, your quote unquote bio just struck me as like, there's so much of a human in that, in that, in this one embodiment, you know, when we think about justice, social, uh, environmental, economic justice, mm -hmm. there's so much there, but that that one individual has to confront on an ongoing basis. And so to think about them as separate, uh, goes back to the same idea, seeing a, a person of color or an indigenous right. person. And that is the only thing that aspect of that human being, yes. as opposed to this um, incredibly rich, interconnected, all the things, you know, when we talk to, when we think about the, the concept of an indigenous person's viewpoint, mm. uh, they do not see themselves as separate from the land. They are the tree. They are the sky. Uh, when you when you think about Buddhist cultures, this idea of oneness is has been there for, well, for as long as we've been here. Mm -hmm. um, and so to think about them as separate is really doing us a disservice and will cause more crisis. Absolutely. But the opposite is something quite amazing. Mm-hmm. I love that you you are promoting that the work be done on an individual basis because think about when I think about that I think about how what the impact of let's say 50% more people having 
let's say 10% more people having this level of heightened awareness, these 3D glasses. That is, that will shift the world in such a tremendous way where we're not looking at, you know, money versus environment. We're looking at how they're all interrelated and interconnected. I think that if we could just do that, you yes. know, I think right now, anyone listening, if they could just realize that they don't need to wait. And they and don't need to choose. No. They're all, it's all the one thing. Yeah. And yeah. in fact, you have it right now, right in front of you. Mm-hmm. You have the ability to go out and there's so many great resources out there. Uh, with this podcast, I can send you a bunch that you can. Yes, we will. Us- we will actually list a lot of the resources when we publish this podcast, so that anyone can go on and, yeah. and actually do some further research. Because I know we're short, and this is such a huge topic mm-hmm. to unpack in such a short time. But hopefully, people get curious enough about it. Yeah, you know. And as you say, it's just one small. You don't have to change the world. You just have to start looking. You have to change yourself. Yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, the world will change. Yes. The moment you change yourself, the whole world around you will change yes. because your perspective will change mm-hmm. and you'll never see the world the same again. That's amazing. And that is going to be the most powerful thing that you can do. Yeah. I just want to let that sit for a minute because that is incredible. Mm. And I know a lot of people think that this work is huge, but it's not. It starts with just opening the we- a website doing some thinking about, you know, what, what are your thoughts behind something that you find resistant resist, you find yourself resisting. Yeah. You know, I, one of the things I certainly have in my own practice is when I find myself resisting something, a thought, a belief, a system, uh, I, that's a good checkpoint for me to, to say, hang on a second, why am I resisting? Mm. And so I think when you, when we think about, taking a leadership role in yourself, you know, the, the resist resistance is a really great teacher. Mm-hmm. And to start there just takes that level of awareness, but then there's so much more resources out there for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. And I love that. I love that when there's resistance that you need to check in. I mean, I have a agreements that I do before I start sessions where I just set the tone. Um, and one of the agreements is to shift judgment to wonder Mm-hmm. and to lead with curiosity. So that moment that you feel that level of judgment, even if it's self judgment come up in your body mm-hmm. to, to kind of lead with that kind of childlike wonder, you know, yes. that you hear the, the hundred questions that you get from kids Yes, and to lead with curiosity of like, what's going on there. Mm-hmm. And you know, change, change is, is incremental and change is imperfect. Yes. And, um, the first session that I do for folks uh, whenever I do training is it starts with you, uh, which is the letter U. It's a bit of a, uh, I use it as like you as a person, but also uncovering and understanding unconscious bias. So the letter U and the second changer j- second session is it changes with us. Mm-hmm. It starts with you. Right. I and see. it changes with yeah. us. Yeah. And that's a follow-up session to really talk about collective action and collective change. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about your process because I, you know, we're, we're going to start coaching together, which I'm really, I, I'm, I'm so much looking forward to this, but let's talk about your process really. So that, you know, you talked about the, the change mm-hmm. theory. theory of change, but when, when someone is, decides to work with you, the first, the first sort of opening up is the you. Yeah. And what does that look like? It, we, there's a bunch of different exercises that are, uh, that we do together. Um, one actually can be found online. It's a video that I did, which is, um, a circle of trust exercise that a lot of uh, diversity experts use. Uh, and I, I then, you know, of course add my own spin to it because I think the circle of trust exercise is something that can leave people in a pit of despair a little yes. bit, right? As yep. change does. Yes. Uh, and then what I've done is I've added another layer, which is then the circle of influence of how you can actually get out of that pit of despair and expand your perspective through increasing your sphere of influence. Mm-hmm. Cause right now we're just, everything is validated uh, and personalized to our current thoughts and beliefs mm-hmm. when it comes to anything that we are engaging with online because of lo- the lovely cookies yes. that we have that we enjoy. Yeah. Everything you see is based on a previous search 
or a previous purchase yes. or a previous like or a previous comment. So whatever we are thinking and feeling and are interested in is being validated. Therefore, affinity bias is absolutely on the rise. Mm -hmm. Affinity bias is a bias of um, really feeling comfortable and safe with things that you like and know. Right. Now think about that in relation to the people that you surround yourself with. It's very likely that they reflect who you are. Right. Whether they reflect who you are from a racial perspective, from a from an able-bodied perspective, from a socioeconomic perspective, right. from a gender identity perspective, and onward and on mm-hmm. and on and on around the different dimensions of difference. Yes. Because once we're challenged with something where we get that friction and resistance, we're like, oh, we're not not really I'm not vibing with this person. We're not really jamming. Whereas when you get the validation of, oh, I had such a bad day. I have this conversation with my partner and someone's like, absolutely, you know, Uh and that feels good. Yes. And, And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have that. Right. But if we really did dive in deeply into who we surround ourselves with and how much validation we're getting, we then start need to be confronted by the homogeneity of that perspective. And so that exercise really brings that to the forefront. I call that, you know, it's a very technical term. I call it the oh shit moment <laughs> that, we, yeah. that a lot of people have. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and then we get out of that by talking about how we can expand your influence. And then that's homework. Like that is like, let's get to work. What podcasts can you listen to? What books can you read? Mm-hmm. What films can you watch? What people can you start following on, on Instagram yeah. or TikTok or whatever yeah. platform you use, LinkedIn? Because the moment that you hear from that person's actual perspective, you're hearing from them. You're not reading about them. You're right. not reading a character. Yes. It really increases a level of empathy. So that's the first exercise that we do. Um, and then we start diving deeper into how we can challenge that per- your perspective And then we even go as far as um, there's a really great choose your own adventure exercise around microaggressions. Mm. And so that's kind of now we're, we've dove in into, we've deep dive into you. We've given you homework of how you can shift your perspectives. Now I'm going to put you in the shoes of someone else. And there's um, an awesome person, a young activist who put together a choose your own adventure game where you can choose to either be um, a black woman with a disability or a, a gay white man. And you have to navigate the world for a year Amazing. in their shoes. Yeah. And that I'll put the link to that also in okay. the podcast because I, I do feel like that's a really great thing to do. It's uncomfortable AF. Yes. And there are fewer and fewer options as you go on, as someone starts feeling a bit more disenfranchised and disconnected and it's hard, Yeah, but you have to experience the world through this person's perspective. It does not replace being a black woman with a disability at all, but what it does is it provides you insight into some of the, the interactions that she might have that we deem as microaggressions, Mm -hmm. but they become macro after the, level of, of consistency. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and it's, it's interesting. So that kind of shifts your perspective from yourself to then gaining empathy. And then we go into, um, identifying systems. I use my own theory of change. You Mm -hmm. know, I, I have to, in order for it to be consistent and also to have the change that I'm trying to achieve. So then we deep dive into systems that you are involved with and how we can start shifting them. And then we start looking at case studies uh, of real world examples Uh um, and start diving into some external aspects, including what does your advocacy look like? Where are you going to champion change? And what does that look like in three months, in six months, in a year? What commitments are you willing to make? And don't you forget that I will not forget those commitments. Uh So accountability there as well and having a partner in that accountability journey. But it's interesting because I remember how I said I was a bridge builder. I won't walk across that bridge. Yes. You write your own accountability commitment. You give it to me in a postcard that I give you and then I send it right back to you. I see. That's And it is your own words. Yes. Your own commitment that comes to hopefully either kick you in the butt or to pat you on the back depending Mm -hmm. on how well you've done with it. Yeah. This I, I just want to reiterate what we were talking about, where the the discomfort and resistance is the teacher in a way, 
uh, of you starting to get like it's it's the point where you start to become curious as opposed to leaning back out of it. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to stress that for listeners is that don't be afraid of being uncomfortable. It's a good thing. Right. It means you're doing the work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, like we're we're not we're not sugarcoating it at all. But one thing I do want folks to know is to be gentle with yourself. That this isn't a process where you know you're going to do these exercises. And then you're going to really start seeing the shift and changes around you. In fact, the more you learn about this, the crappier things feel. Mm -hmm. And because the more you see, yes, you know, it's the more, you know, the more injustice all of a sudden seems to be around you. When you think about social uh, injustice, economic injustice, you know, indigenous injustice and Mm -hmm. racial injustice, and ecological injustice, the more you start to dive into them, it does start feeling, it starts feeling a bit overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So I do want to recognize that. And so to be gentle with yourself, don't feel like you need to tackle everything all at once. I know it might sound horribly pragmatic, but do think about considering prioritizing some specific issues that are really important to you. Right. So if there are specific dimensions of difference that you're connected to, and by that I mean... Um, ability, socioeconomic status, climate change, race, gender, gender identity. If there's things that you are drawn towards that you want to learn more about and actually become, uh, an activist or a champion or ally, uh, in, then feel it's okay to prioritize them. Yes. You know, knowing that intersectionality exists. Yes. So if you're thinking about really wanting to be a champion of, of folks with a disability, You know, there's queer folks with disabilities. There's racialized folks with disabilities. Learn about, about that particular community through their own perspective and, uh, and then become a champion uh, for them and advocate for them. And I always tell folks to use the ADCs of, uh, of, uh, social impact, which is advocacy, donate, like put your money where your mouth is and celebrate. Right. Uh, and so, with that, you know, comes educating yourself, obviously. Uh, but, you know, the ADCs of, of showing up are, are right. really important. I think it's also really important to stress that you're not alone on this journey either. You know, the, the fact that you're doing this work, other people are willing to do this work. Indigenous communities have people who are, are advocating out there. And, you know, there there's actually courses you can take mm-hmm. at university now for this sort of thing, which you know, was, did not exist. Did not exist. Yeah. Um, 14 you know, years ago. You're, it did you're, not exist. You, yeah. you're not alone on the yeah. journey. Um, there are lots of, I, you know, to talk about intersectionality, you can, you can take one cause and really uh, dive into it. And, 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 but there are other people who will take other causes. So you don't really have to take it all. I think one of the things I'm, I find um, when I talk to people on this subject is that there's so much to do mm-hmm. and there's a sense of overwhelm. And so I, I do want to stress that it's really important to take a breath, take a, stre- a step back and, and take the first step, only the first step. Mm-hmm. And then that will open up the next step for you, as opposed to thinking about all the steps that you have to take to be a champion of this work. Um, I, and going back to the idea that it, it starts with you personally taking that first step. Yeah. And so it becomes a little bit more digestible, a little mm-hmm. bit more accessible and also, uh, to, to allow our listeners to, I love to play the imagine game because, you know, as, as an architect and designer, just, we imagine, uh, and, and then it becomes reality. And so I want to play the imagine game a little bit and just think about in your, in, in a, li- in our listeners community, uh, let's say go back to that 10% of people, including yourself starts to go through this process. Mm. What does that community, what's the impact in just that community with just 10% of people doing this work? I mean, you've probably seen this shift before. Mm-hmm. I wonder if you could talk to this. Yeah. What does um, our world look like with just 10%, 10% of people doing yeah. this work? I mean, I think more and more people are starting to do this work. And I, I do think shifts happen. I mean, the most recent example is uh, a very unfortunate example of um, a black person down south being killed while he was just running, Mm -hmm. you know, and, and that case would not have actually seen the light of day 
no arrests would have been made if not for his family mm -hmm. actually protesting and, and really fighting for that to happen. It would not have happened if protests, actual protests did not actually happen in the streets. Mm -hmm. It would not have happened if the rest of the world did it actually care, you know, right. like the rest of the world stopped for a minute and actually realized what we've always known, which is that black lives do matter mm -hmm. and that inequities do exist. And that, you know, the propensity of violence is so much ha higher on black bodies. All of that had to ha happen in order for, for his, his family and for him to have gotten the justice that he deserves. Mm -hmm. And that case went to court And those men were found guilty on felony accounts. And I think that is, is an example when a, when a 10% or a percentage of the population rallies around a cause mm -hmm. is that you do have the ability to create change. And we need to celebrate those wins, even though it's a loss of a young, a young life. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When it, when something seems so overwhelming that we cannot change the system around racial injustice. We need to celebrate this win and recognize that we can actually make a difference when we come together. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's a really great example of that. And what we also saw was a global pandemic that literally stopped the world. Yes. And we saw that we as a global community can actually get a vaccine, multiple vaccines out there with in less in, in less than a year. Mm -hmm. We can restructure supply chains. We can create new systems. Uh, we can put, put, you know, public health policies and orders out there to increase safety of our community if we do it together and we look at it from a systemic and intersectional approach. Right. Whether it's healthcare, healthcare, obviously hospitals and the public health order origins, education, our school systems, our own local economy, our own local businesses, our, our restaurants. All of those systems and those peoples and organizations had to work together to create yes. a system that was going to work to keep us safe. Now imagine a system that created a world where we were seen, yes. where we were valued, yes. where we were heard, where we have a sense of belonging, and where we have a future for our children yeah. and their children. Yeah. We know we can do it. Anyone who tells me they can't do it, we literally have a case study yes a promising pat practice that is happening in the world right now of what will happen when the, when our local community, when we as individuals for the collective good, get vac vaccinated, put a mask on social distance. Yeah. That's individuals yeah. where our local communities rally behind us and support us by creating health measures of social distancing of mask wearing of restaurants and double vaccinations yeah where our educational system keep our kids safe by having masks, by social distancing. Like I literally, there's mm -hmm. examples where our healthcare Recent system. Recent examples. Like right yeah. now, yeah. people, we know we can do this yes. if we work together and that if we reduce the barriers of saying like it's too complicated. Mm -hmm. It's not. It's not complicated. There has to be the will to do it. But there has to also be, we have to go back to just recognizing that we're all in this together And we need to care for each other, yes. like truly care. Yeah. I know that when someone gets to know me, they, they want me to have a life where I live my authentic self and live my, in my authentic self and, and to be, have self-determination of what it is yeah. to, to be who I am. I know they do. They see my dimples. We get, we get along, you know, <laughs> yes. I cook something for them. We build a relationship. Yeah. Let's do that. Let's mm -hmm. get to know our neighbors again. Let's not live in ivory towers with closed doors. Mm -hmm. The more invested we are in each other's growth and each other's safety and each other's joy, the better the world will be. And yeah. I know that sounds for everyone, but yeah. yeah, but it would be the better the world would be for everyone. Yeah. If we work together and we have an example of how we can do that. I think that's a great place to, to end. Great. And I hope that you, because we have so much more to talk about and just one episode is just scratching the surface. So we will post some of those resources that you mentioned and hopefully we can have you back on the Happy Texture podcast again. We can Absolutely. take a deeper dive into a lot of these things. I am looking forward to coaching with you so much and I can't wait to be a leader in my community and, and to see the shifts in perspective in my own self. So thank you for the work you do and 
Thank you for being in the Happy Texture Podcast. Awesome. And just remember, it starts with you, but it changes with us. Yes. And that's how we'll, that's how we're going to solve this. Amazing. Thank you, Emil. Thank you. For more information on this or any other episodes of the Happy Texture Podcast, you can find us at happytexture.com. H-A-P-P-I-T-E-C-T-U-R-E dot com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Cora Architecture and Interiors. Designing places for being. Post-production by Vanessa Hennessy.